silencing slavery. It's a discussion that we must have. It's a discussion covering critical race theory and black youth struggles that were put in place by society. And right now, our youth all around the world are experiencing these same exact problems. And this seminar it opens up a discussion for us to talk about these same exact problems while also hoping for a brighter and better future. Now, what is critical race theory? What does that entail? Well, critical race theory is an academic practice, academic concept that is more than 40 years old. The core idea is that racism is a social construct and that it is merely not the product of individual bias or prejudice, but also something that's embedded in our legal policies and systems. Now, today for our event, we have a very informative, educational, interesting event. We have a handful of talented speakers for you today. I can't wait till we get right into it. So now, without further ado, I'd like to pass it off to Miriam. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I wanna thank you for taking the time out of your day to tune into this RISE Youth Seminar. We all hope that you learn something and leave this seminar with a better understanding of what it's like to be a Black youth today. Now, as you all know, we are here to discuss the triumphs and the trials that Black youth go through and how the critical race theory affects us all. Whether through microaggressions, stereotyping, or straight up racism, society puts barriers, both seen and unseen, in place that have very harmful effects on Black youth today. Even though it may seem like we have progressed as a society over time and have become more equal, understanding of one another, or inclusive, I believe, and I'm sure that you will all agree with me when I say that we have a lot more work to do regarding genuinely being equal and on a leveled playing field. I remember one day when I was hanging out with my family and we all decided to go to the corner store and it was a group of about five or six of us. And while we were walking around the corner store, the owner started to follow us and keep tabs on us. And eventually, it got to the point where we asked him why he was following us. And he said something along the lines of, to make sure you guys aren't stealing and to make sure you guys aren't taking anything. And I think that when we walked into the corner store, we all felt the energy shift. And we all had the understanding that the owner was looking at us and keeping tabs on us because we were black. We didn't even have to say anything to each other or look at each other to understand what was going on. And by the end of our visit to that corner store, the owner threatened to call the police on us. He was so nervous and uncomfortable with all of us being in the store. And trust me when I say that we were not in the store causing any sort of commotion or problems, but this man was so uneasy about the fact that we were all together that he felt the need to call the police so that they could handle us. So we all got our stuff and we left. After that experience, I thought about how that situation could have ended and how many people who look like me have gone through situations like that but have ended up a lot worse than me. And it simply just has to do with the fact that we're black and it has to do with our skin color. We went in there to buy sweets and to buy drinks and we left with the owner threatening to call the police on us. And it's experiences like those that can really hurt people, especially when they're young. And after that experience, it made me hyper aware of the fact that even though I know my intentions are good and pure, that's not how everyone is going to look or see me. And black youth have to learn and realize from a young age that no matter who you are, where you are, or where you come from, people will always have their preconceived notions about you. And there's nothing that we can do about it. I don't think any amount of growth or progression is going to change that, at least not now. These stereotypes made against us make us think and live differently from our white counterparts and those who don't look like us. Because of these stereotypes, we have to work even harder to be seen in a positive light. 
As soon as people see us, they think about how we're probably going to steal something or cause some sort of trouble. Or they'll come up with all of these ideas about who we are before they can even get to know us as a people or as a person. Which is so destructive to our community because we don't even get a chance, especially as young people. When we hear things like, oh, you're smart for a black boy, or oh, you can swim, or oh, you're really pretty for a black girl, we don't take them as compliments or positive statements because they're not. They have some negative connotation to them, no matter how you look at them or how you say them. One day, I was reading an article that said, black young children from the ages of zero to eight were almost three times more likely to be rated as lazier than white adults. And it also said that young black children were more than twice as likely to be rated as unintelligent or violent prone than white children of the same age. Can you imagine that? Can we all take a moment to think about that? From zero to eight, you can't even form coherent sentences for two to three out of those eight years, and you are already seen as more violent, lazy, and unintelligent than your white counterparts, even white adults. And these stereotypes are used against us from birth. And as I've said before, there's nothing that we can really do about it. When learning about the critical race theory, I thought about how it's so crazy how we have to call learning about actual history the critical race theory and not history. I would love to hear the true story of not only America, but the world. And I know that I could do my research and trust me, I do. But being able to access this information throughout my school systems and the school systems worldwide would have such a positive effect on youth all over the world. Because let's be honest, what they teach us in school is not history, but it's a very modified and sugar-coated version of the past. And as I did my research, I thought to myself, and I was like, why would this be a bad thing? Why do people disagree with this? And I found out that the people who disagree with this style of learning think that students should learn about equality and unity and learning to love each other. And they wanna create this false narrative that America is this free country and everything that happened in the past is in the past and we don't have to learn about it or talk about it anymore. So basically, they wanna to lie to all their students. As we know, the history of the world is not a fairy tale. Literal blood, sweat, tears, and trauma went into the construction of the most powerful countries today and even into the construction of the world. And the same people that are preaching about equality and unity are the same people that call peaceful protests and marches riots. And they're the same people who call the people who storm the Capitol, the people who are fighting for their rights and fighting for their unalienated rights. And my question is, how are you going to teach lies and expect there to be unity among all people? And the funny thing is, is that they don't even teach us about unity in school. They teach the same old whitewashed stories. And when it's time to apply that, they, that same unity that they preach, it's an act of terrorism. They see it as an act of terrorism. And these people don't want unity and equality. They want silence and compliance. And I don't think that we should stand for this any longer as the youth. I am personally so tired of hearing my people have to repeat the same old songs. Time and time again, we have to say, I'm not a thug, I'm not a troublemaker, and I'm not the stereotype you make me out to be. I'm so much more than that. And we always get people standing with us and agreeing with us. But then we have to say the same things and repeat the same things over and over again. And we're seeing the same outcomes. At this point, everyone needs to understand that the negative thoughts that you group with my skin color do not define me. But what defines me is my actions, not the way I look and not the person you think I am before you talk to me. So to my young people, especially to the young people that look like me, we need to let people know that the 30 second apologies with the crocodile tears will no longer suffice. 
This cancel culture that we all partake in has done nothing because people are canceled for maybe a week and then everything is back to normal again. We need to start holding people accountable and let them know that this disrespect is not something that we will stand for anymore. How we hold people accountable is with consistency, not playing favorites and setting the right example for the people around us. Now, trust me, I know that this is a lot easier said than done, but it is vital for us to reach our ultimate goals. And we all know that we're the future leaders of the world. We're the future business owners, the future icons, the future game changers, the future educators, artists, physicians, professional athletes, mothers, fathers, and everything else that comes under the sun. So let's start now to pave the way for those after us to follow us and create that positive change that has been needed for centuries. Sitting back and accepting these stereotypes and saying that that's just the way life is and accepting negativity will no longer do. We already know how influential we are as young people. So we need to use that influence to our advantage Without using the tools like the critical race theory and holding people accountable, how do we expect to see any sort of change? I truly believe that we are the spark needed to ignite this change. I want to thank you all again for listening to me, and I hope that you really listen and and enjoy the rest of the speeches that you will be hearing today. Thank you. Big ups to Mary for delivering that awesome, insightful speech. Now, now we'd like to move on to our next educated, talented speaker. Her name is Jerusha, and she'll be representing the UK branch. And her topic will be Erasing Black History. Welcome everyone to this event today. I hope everyone has enjoyed listening to that eye-opener speech as being presented by Rise to Learn. And I hope you continue to stay tuned in. Now the topic I will be touching on is the erasing of black history. You will find that over time in society within school system, it's evident that they either do not want our our history to be taught in schools and or they gloss over it because they are told they have to. We can get into this a little bit later on. The erasing of black history leads to a lack of understanding and a lack of knowledge within the black community. And as a nation, this for us is a crisis. Not knowing or not having a sound awareness about one's identity, which is something our history teaches, is disparaging. Subsequently, damaging and can cause an emotional disturbance and or cause one to have misconception about the way the world sees them or how they see themselves. Being able to stand in our own skin with a full sound awareness is where we want our foundations to lie, because this place is a place of empowerment. Empowerment is the process of becoming stronger and more confident, especially in controlling one's life and claiming one's rights. It means taking back our own authority and power. However, my mother has always taught me that power must come with responsibility. If our people were taught about the struggles in which our ancestors had to go through to allow them to be standing in the position that they are today, maybe the youth will see things differently maybe with much more gratitude and decide to take up the lantern and keep burning the fire. This would, pos- this would possibly choose, they would possibly choose to do better and be better every day. But those who want to stay on top wouldn't want that now, would they? And there so, we see it, the raising of the true black history. We have all witnessed how authorities respond to us expressing our thoughts and feelings to racial injustices we face today. But if we stood together in power, there would maybe be no more talk of inequality. Could it even exist? How did it even begin in the first place? As a youth trying to start off a prosperous generation, I believe it's my job to give some understanding to my fellow counterparts and teach them about how we got to a place we are today and how we can improve things for the further future. The first way in doing this is to educate you on our history and teach you about how we were enslaved and how we became enslaved, to teach you about our journey and also to educate you on how we prospered before we were colonized. 
Now, in 1619s, the Europeans travelled over to the continent of Africa, in which, in which black nations of people were held captive and forced to be slaves. The true names of these descendants were Jacobites, the grandson of Abraham. Jacobites were expected to work as indentured servants in labour in production of crops, such as tobacco and cotton. We were kidnapped and taken from our countries, countries we can no longer identify with today. We were sold like groceries, but worse, we were raped and lynched, treated less than any living being. How can a human race justify that? It is insane to rationalise that because we are black and are brown skin, that we are inferior. But those who are pink, red or white skin are superior. It, yeah, it wasn't insane to think it then. When the outcome was right before their eyes every day to witness, see and feel. For hundreds and hundreds of years, we were treated less than animals, less than dogs, and were not able to get out of this hell. Today, from a personal experience, I've seen that so many young black boys and girls, especially in my school, who still, still don't know their background of their own history. This allowed them to put youngers like me in a position where particular topics were being brought up around the Black Lives Matter discussion in which some black and brown skinned youngers were agreeing with racial comments being made by their white counterparts. This created a division between our so-called black children. Some of my peers had not been educated on the reasons why what their white counterparts were saying was unacceptable, inaccurate and plain wrong. They could not see how it went against them as well as me. I, although, could hear the comments being made and was able to stand up for what I believe to be fair and just. Whereas the other half of the black children were agreeing with the, uh, their white counterparts, who they obviously looked up to. Being in a position like this was embarrassing on the whole of the community, as it created an idea of separation between us. But then I had to th acknowledge that not all black nations are the same. The children of slavery were Jacobites, and the Jacobites were sold by the older, by the other black nations to the white nations in trade and exchange. Where will you ever find this in our history, if not from a man of God? In my personal opinion, one cause of these black students not being educated on their history is down to the school curriculum as their job is to prepare us for our future and give us the knowledge we need to enter the real world. However, they continue to gloss over our history. But black history is relevant, not only in history, but in sociology, psychology, humanity, biology, economics, food, religious education, P and business. And that is just stating a few. We have been dominant and significant part of every walk of life from the beginning in whatever field it is. Look, at, look into the history and you will find us. An example of an important event that took place but was not taught in schools is the Rindros scandal. First off, it starts with who the Rindros generation were. The Rindros generation were those who arrived from the Caribbean countries to the UK between 1948 and 1973, in which many filled building jobs in the NHS and other sectors that were affected by Britain's post-war labour shortages. Caribbeans who were part of the Commonwealth and who arrived, uh, were, who arrived were already subjects and were free to permanently live and work within the UK. However, in 2017, the Windrush scandal began to surface. It had been released that hundreds of Commonwealth citizens, many who were part of the Windrush generally, had wrongly been detained, deported and denied legal rights. Reason for this scandal to take place was the idea that because Commonwealth citizens were affected by the government's hostile environment legislation, which was a policy announced in 2012, which tasked in the NHS, landlords, banks, employers, and many other enforcing immigrant controls. It aimed to make UK unlivable for, for undocumented migrants and ultimately push them to leave. 
And due to many big people being a part of the Windrush generation being children who arrived through their parents' passport, the UK used this, as their, used this to their advantage to quietly remove them out of the UK. This shows the, the huge idea of the UK hiding and erasing our history. It shows that the UK does, has its downfalls and is not as innocent as it is presented to be. Therefore, after hearing this and hearing that people came from the Caribbean to help contribute to this country after labour shortages after the World War, why is it that I have never been taught about the contributions of my black ancestors? Why am I always continue to be taught about how we were enslaved and oppressed rather than how we contribute to this country and how we helped to build up this economy to be where it is today? Was it not us that contributed to the railroads, homes, university, traffic lights, and so, so much more? And there, and there are so many inventors who helped contribute to this economy on a global scale, such as Lewis Lattimore, who was a young black man who contributed to the vital component of the light bulb, and soon later went on to improve the road road car, the bathrooms, and the early air conditioner. So next time you're escaping a hot day outside, outside in your cool house, don't forget Lewis Lattimore. Or even Garrett Morgan who created the safety hood in which it helps firefighters to navigate smoky building, buildings. Mary Van Britten Brown, a black nurse who created the first home security. And this list could go on and on and on. So many contributions were made by black people, although this may come as a shock. I believe that it's time we are taught about the sacrifices and the contributions that we made by those who were black. We have contributed so much to this country and I don't believe this should go unknown or unseen. The critical race theory argue and try and put the idea that schools, curriculum and education departments should educate us on our black history, which I 100% agree. Black children and black adults being taught about their history will allow them to enter the world knowing that they are not equal to their fellow counterparts. And although this is hard to admit, it's the harsh reality that we as black people have to face in today's society. And if we are able to know this, if we are able to acknowledge that we are different, then we can continue to be different, but be different in a positive and an empowering way. We can break the ideas of us being less than and become more than, whether it's within our community or a change in norms. The critical race theory embraces the idea of black history should no longer be hidden or taught and embraced as a stepping stone for, for the black community. However, this theory has been argued as others, others believe that it shouldn't be taught as there's no need to go back into the past as society is better. But let me tell you, society is not better. And it's for us as a community to go against the norms and the values and educate ourselves and our families that we do not fall back into the same pattern. In conclusion, it's, it's seen that we are not able to rely on our school systems as they continue to teach us, they continue not to teach us on situations that may not, that may inevitably affect us, such as humanity or blackness and how we are viewed as a community, as a whole. We have found out that schools gloss over our history books and they don't want the truth to be revealed about how black people suffered as, and who were inflicting the suffering as it goes against the whole views of the UK and, uh, and how the UK is perceived as a whole. However, however, I believe it is our time to break all these social constructs and how we are viewed to begin to educate ourselves on our history books. So either way, if our history continues to be erased within society, we should show unity and come together and let it be known that our history will not be forgotten and use it to our advantage. We have to understand that our identities are it. We have to have the understanding of our identities and be able to empower one another as a community to be better and do better. If we're able to set up new mindsets for ourselves, there will no longer be anyone to look down on us. We will have the understanding of our past and how to overcome it. Black history will no longer be able to be erased as we will be teaching it and passing it from generation to generation. As I said, we will be able to pick up the lantern and keep the fire burning. Thank you to all that are listening. Thank you to all viewers watching today and listening.
I hope you continue to stay tuned in. Let's go, Jerusha. Good job. What an awesome speech. Now, next we have Ezra representing the St. Louis branch. And he'll be delivering a speech titled Brutality. For the past 400 years, there has been tremendous pain put on the black man and woman as a result of racial inequity here in the Americas. That pain has been placed upon the community in many ways, including mentally and emotionally. But we must never forget the physical acts of violence that so heavily contributed to that oppression. The same violence that urged whites to enslave a nation of blacks off the coast of Africa. The same violence that separated babies and children from mothers and tore fathers away from families. The same violence that hung and lynched the black man for carrying out his constitutional rights. The same violence that let dogs out on black protesters fighting to obtain these rights. The same violence that unmercifully shoots, beats, and murders our black men and women in the streets and in their homes in cold blood. The mob violence, the police violence, race is the one and only reason for it. With the recent untimely passing of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and the ones that suffered even before them, such as Rodney King, Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, and Tamir Rice. The brutal history of our people was and is a race thing. We must analyze history, our legislation, and our education through a racial lens. Because time after time, the same words apply differently to different people due to the color of their skin. In 1776, Thomas Jefferson signed the United States Constitution, stating that all men were created equal. <laughs> Race is pretty important in deciphering how we understand that message. Blacks do not get the benefit of the doubt within the law, yet we get the punishment of it. Time after time, we've seen that legislative ignorance is legislative violence. The physical torment of blacks did not end in 1776. It did not end in 1865. It did not end in the 1960s. Policy has always been a part of this pain. The true studying of history and for one to be committed to its accuracy requires conversation involving racial inequality. We look around today and we still see the same pain and violence being afflicted on black people. We cannot separate race from how we learn about history and how we apply that history to our legislation, our education system, and our society as a whole. <clears throat> so what is critical race theory? Critical race theory, as coined by Kimberlé Crenshaw, I think I got her name right, is not necessarily a thing, but a way to look at things, a way to look at the law, a way to understand why after hundreds of years of people fighting for their rights, that even through legislative change designed to combat injustice, that their true freedoms still are not realized. How is this possible? How can we live in a supposed forward-thinking society filled with equality and a law that applies to everybody, yet still see the disparity of our societies. That is what critical race theory aims to understand and realize. It's becoming a real popular term lately, so I thought I would clear up exactly what it is that we're discussing. But to further investigate how these things are possible, 
I point you to the one factor that is consistent in the oppression of our people. Brutality. When a slave says that he has enough and he chooses to run away from his master, what did they do to that slave? They cut his foot off. When a slave was being overworked and began to underperform in the field, what did they do to that slave? They whipped him. They sold him. They beat him. They took his wife. They took his children. They took his manhood. Part of the effectiveness of Chatsau slavery was brutalization. Brutalization was the glue that held slavery together. How can you have a plantation full of hundreds and hundreds of black slaves being ran by four or five white masters? How is this possible? How does that work? How can one establish that kind of control? It was told that when a white master first buys a group of slaves, he would find the strongest one. He would find the one that showed the most leadership qualities within the group. And you know what he would do? He would publicly and brutally kill that slave. What does this do? This sends a message. It sends a message to everyone else to stay down and fall in line. Through physical cruelty, through physical, brutal cruelty, we have now enticed fear to those that witness or hear of such events. This is the basis of brutalization. Later, it became the basis of Jim Crow. Just recently, I was able to take a visit up to Tulsa, Oklahoma more specifically Greenwood, the origin of Black Wall Street. If you know what Black Wall Street was, it was one of the most successful black towns in the nation in the 1900s. Blacks had their freedom to buy land and become specialized workers. So you had doctors and lawyers and real estate agents and companies and movie theaters and airports, a bustling community of black people working together to move the black dollar around. Did you know that whole 40 block town was burned down to the ground? Innocent civilians were killed in the streets by white mobs driving through the town with shotguns killing any blacks that they saw. Merciless deaths. They flew planes over the town and dropped bombs on its civilians. Why? Brutality is the one consistency that was a part of the oppression of black people. From Chateau slavery to Jim Crow to the Ku Klux Klan. Through the Civil Rights Movement, physical violence was how it was conducted to incite fear. Now we look at an American, sorry, now we look at America today, born in these ideals, born in these ideals, where America incarcerates more people than any other country in the world. And blacks take up nearly 40% of the prisons, despite only taking up 13% of the population. This is the continuing of this brutality in other forms. Once again, send a message to those who observe it to instill fear. When looking at the justice system and the police system, we see the continuation of that power to control. So when we see a George Floyd, when we see a Mike Brown, when we see a Trayvon Martin, many reactions is, oh no, how can this happen? Instead of, when did it ever stop happening? Brutality is the glue that holds the dynamics of power out of our favor. This is why we cannot settle when it comes to our legislation, our school systems, our healthcare systems, our employment systems, all of it. 
because things are not equal just because it says so on paper. No, we can and will not achieve true equity for our people until we remove the racist mindsets of the nation. Give it up for Ezra, representing the St. Louis, Missouri branch. Now, we are halfway through our event, and I hope everything is beginning to resonate with our audience. That our youth, we're lively, we're ready to work. We're ready, we're, we're sick and tired of, you know, how we're betrayed. We're sick and tired of all the things that's happening in our community. And we're ready to change that. We're hoping for a brighter future. Our plan is to restore integrity, confidence back into our community, all right? So with that being said, I'd love to pass it off to Levi, another representation of the UK branch. And he'll be delivering a speech titled, The Age of Social Media. Hello to all of you today that has taken the time out to sit and witness the great words, speeches, and arguments presented to you by RISE. The topic in which I will attempt to tackle is whether the impacts of social media are positive or detrimental to black youths of today, and whether the critical race theory has any covert or overt effects on us. Now, you may be asking yourself, what is the critical race theory? The critical race theory is an academic movement of civil rights activists and scholars in the United States who seek to critically examine the law as it intersects with issues of race and to challenge mainstream liberal approaches to social justice. Those who are believers of the critical race theory believe that ethnic minorities, especially those of black backgrounds, are victims of their own skin color. Therefore, those who are in agreement of this theory try to combat this injustice in every way possible. Now, does social media have a valuable or a detrimental impact on us as black youths? Throughout my argument, you will see that although social media does have its imperfections, that I am in favour of it. The reason being is that it benefits young entrepreneurs of today and that it gives the youth a role to play in healing political divides and social injustice. One of the arguments as to why we must accept that social media has a positive impact on black youths is that this tool allows for the potential widespread awareness of black businesses and therefore allows us to market our businesses for little to no cost. Now I can proudly say that since 2019, the amount of businesses built by young black men and women, boys and girls, has drastically increased and drastically developed. Now we must consider the facts and not brush them away. According to Forbes, Facebook is the second, the second most visited website on the web. We must also take into account that there are approximately 4 billion active internet users on the planet which should then lead us to make an accurate suggestion that social media is an integral part of the average human lifestyle. We must now apply this to how it affects us as black youths in society. May I bring up two examples to corroborate with my argument? Hadassah Jackson, owner of Dasa Cosmetics, after being interviewed about a topic at hand, stated that without social media, not many people would know about her business. She went on to say that during the first quarantine, many people were on social media and that this gave her the opportunity to market her business and hopefully gain support as someone may stumble across her products. Another clear-cut example of the effects that social media have on young black business owners is displayed through quotes made by Shondell Fowler, owner of NF Collections. She said, that social media is a great opportunity for networking with small business owners from around the world, even allowing for collaboration. This therefore not only allows for exposure, but it builds a sense of unity among black youths in society. 
as there is a reciprocated support among the businesses. For those at home, please take deep thought as to whether the argument around the critical race theory is inclusive to black businesses and social media. As stated prior, the critical race theory is a system by which black members of society, whether that be in the United Kingdom, the United States, or anywhere else for that matter, are victims of their skin colour, and therefore those in positions of authority are able to uphold white supremacy in environments such as business and education. Although I believe that the critical race theory fits, fits perfectly in matters such as police brutality and politics, I firmly disagree that it suits the argument based around black youths and social media. Looking at the matter from the shoes of an entrepreneur that uses social media to promote their business, we can see that the theory is limited in this case. A key reason to that is that the theory is based around hierarchy. For example, the lack of black representation on the Board of Education, meaning the prevention of people that look like you and I learning of our heritage in schools. With this lack of representation, a strong argument can be made that there is a sense of white supremacy being upheld as they are subconsciously advocating an educational oppression. Very similar to the education system in South, South Africa apartheid. However, with small businesses, in most cases, the hierarchy is almost non-existent and it will normally be one or two people running the business, hence the term small. Social media is a limitless way in which businesses such as Dasa Cosmetics or NF Collections can promote, market and create an awareness for their business without the hindrance of the so-called higher-ups or those in power, as all it takes is the smallest fraction of the 4 billion internet users to become a social media following for these businesses to then see success. Furthermore, I would like to extend my argument as to why I am an advocate for social media and why I believe that it has positive impacts on black youth around the world. Social media gives the youth a voice that we once never had. It makes our opinions more relevant and more admissible specifically in the world of social injustice. Black youths use these websites, most notably Twitter, to get involved with topics that we find important and to also find like-minded people like ourselves. The online community known as Black Twitter has long been using these platforms to collectively organise, offer support and increase visibility online for black people and issues that matter to us. Let me add some context for you listening at home. The 25th of May, 2020, a 46-year-old man by the name of George Floyd was stopped by the police after suspicion of using a counterfeit $20 bill. During the stop, he was physically abused by his officers with one having his knee on Floyd's neck for a total of 9 minutes and 29 seconds. Floyd sadly passed away on the scene. However, the moment this hit social media, there was a spike in the hashtag Black Lives Matter. As a matter of fact, by June 10th, 2020, almost a whole month later, it had been tweeted roughly 47.8 million times. I'll give you another example. The case of Breonna Taylor a black medical worker who was shot and killed by Louisville police officers in a botched raid on her apartment. Very soon after, the hashtag Justice for Breonna Taylor was put into full effect. People, we see that social media is an outlet where youths can express their opinion without the fear of being scrutinised in real life. These platforms are used as protest grounds where they can yell Black Lives Matter without having the fear of police using excessive force on them. These hashtags and movements not only create awareness for youths across the pond to know of the atrocities happening around the world, but it also puts pressure on those higher up to comment on events as it once was extremely easy for them to dodge the media and not give their opinion. Unity therefore is a byproduct of social media among black youths 
and it plays a key role to the togetherness among the youth. To conclude, I hope the arguments today presented to you about why I believe social media is imperative for the average teenager in our society are clearly displayed and portrayed. However, to balance the argument, it can be argued that there are negatives to social media. An example of this being that it can cause youth to invest in a lifestyle that they cannot afford through the flaunting of others and their so-called riches. This can be detrimental to youth. However, I strongly believe that the positives outweigh the negatives. Black youths of today are more powerful than ever. The drive for us to be successful is unmatched. The courage we show is undeniable. Social media is our digital passport. And so long we use it correctly, we cannot lose. Whether that be to learn a skill, to gain some knowledge or understanding on things that interest us, or to even earn a living. So my last message to you today for the black youth is that if we want to beat the effects of the critical race theory, meaning to not be victims of our own skin colour or our heritage, use social media wisely. If you're stopped by the police, film everything as evidence of potential abuse of your rights and post it on the likes of Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, to even enlighten others on how to handle a situation like this. If you want to learn about your history, YouTube has everything you need. With the use of social media, we as a youth have no excuse. So to the viewers at home watching, I thank you for your time. And I hope you enjoy all the speeches that are presented to you by Rez. Thank you. Give it up for Levi. Give another round of applause for Levi. Okay, what a good job. What a wonderful speech you just delivered. Thank you, Levi. Now, I'd love to spin it off to another educated, talented speaker, and her name is Crystal. She will be representing the St. Louis, Missouri branch, and her topic is shifts in the black community. I think it's time we eradicate the idea of needing a seat at the table. Let me explain myself. Growing up in the black community and living in urban areas, early on in my life, I was exposed to the realities of being a black person in America. We had a neighborhood drug dealer and the resident homeless man or woman on every other block. Every school had metal detectors and it was normal to hear of someone in the district going to the hospital or dying because of a fight or a weapon that was brought to school. We were taught to be very careful of the way we acted and the things we could and couldn't say in the presence of police. The friends we kept were monitored, not to be a bad influence or get us in trouble due to association. Everyone knew to stay away from MLK Drive. And if for whatever reason, you did have to walk down that street, you did it quickly. My experience isn't different from any other person growing up in an urban community. This is likely the experience of most of the black community and these urban communities are deeply associated with black people. However, I have also been able to experience the other side. I was able to live in the suburbs where backyards exist. The neighborhood was quiet, not because no one lived there. Everyone just minded their business with the occasional rowdy children. There were no bodegas in sight, just a CVS here and a Whole Foods there. I have lived in the mostly white community where you wonder how you'll be received by your neighbors, where you become tolerable, acceptable black folk, where you go on a walk or a drive to see if there are any other minorities living in your neighborhood with you. Any black or minority person who's been able to experience this would identically describe what it feels like to find another minority. Look, it's 
a black family. We should be their friends. Myself and many other young people from my generation have lived and grown through the transition of being a part of the black communities that our parents so desperately wished to take us out of to finally getting our seat at the table. Ultimately to still feel like outsiders or at least know a friend that has. I don't say this to say that these accomplishments should now be frowned upon. For our parents' generation, this is what they came to America for. They struggled so that we could be just as good and receive the same opportunities as the white children that couldn't hold a candle to our grades and extracurriculars. The dream ended at, if I could only make my son a doctor, if I could only make my daughter a lawyer, then my family has made it. We are living the American dream. We struggled and it was worth it. As my generation gets older, we've now added to the dream. It doesn't just stop with the people in the room. The dream goes so far beyond that. The glass ceiling that you so faithfully reminded us wasn't there really isn't. In my short time of life, I have witnessed the story forced upon the black community of poverty and struggle begin to be rewritten. I made it is no longer being the house slave, but being the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. I made it is no longer securing a job, but creating them in my own business. I made it is no longer sacrificing my mental health to keep a roof over my head, but creating and making room in my life for the things that I love. I made it is making sure my dollars get recirculated into my community and is supporting black businesses. I made it is going to therapy and making sure my cup is full before trying to pour into anyone else's. I made it is redefining the picture in my head when I say black community. I am proud to see my generation not only taking the steps to accomplish their goals, but prioritizing themselves. I am happy to see black people taking the time to create and fall in love with passions they didn't know they had. I am overjoyed to see black businesses notifying their customers that they are sold out because of the immense support they were shown. I am happy to see my feeds flooded with black love and black families, something stripped from my community due to mass incarceration rates and men not knowing how to be fathers because they never had one of their own, leaving our black women to be mommy, daddy, breadwinner, and homemaker. I am proud to see black parents taking initiative in their children's education and making sure that they know the true history of the world they grow up in. I am proud to see black children seeing themselves in the books they read, the shows they watch, and the content they consume where the black person is not the slave, the poor boy, or the gang member. I am proud to see black men and women going to therapy and healing their inner child. I am happy to see black people on vacation and living their best lives. I am proud to see black people claim a life that they have been told was not for them, that they'd be lucky to have, that they could only watch from the outside looking in. But this is only the beginning. The goal is to actually believe I am black and I am proud. The goal is to create a community that our ancestors would look at as a utopia. 
Now I know I'm only speaking of the good, and there is still so much work to be done in our homes and communities in order for us to reach this goal. However, you need to know what the prize is in order to make the moves to get there. These past two years have been filled with heartache for the black community. But in that heartache, we have begun to reestablish that sense of community that was previously reserved only for times of hardship and have used it as a springboard for success and accomplishment. So again, I say, we need to eradicate the idea of needing a seat at the table. For so long, we convinced ourselves that the solution to racial inequality was to integrate and prove ourselves worthy of mingling with our oppressors. And to the uneducated and ignorant eye, it seems as though we've done a pretty decent job of doing that. However, in the midst of adversity, we have finally proved the black man and black woman worthy to ourselves. We have given ourselves the stamp of approval. We are finally starting to realize the cheat code to the game. Build your own table. You see, the white man will spit in your face and tell you to go back to your country, forgetting that their forefathers, who they worship with idols and statues, did such a good job of erasing our culture our history, our family, our community, that we don't even know where it is we came from. Forgetting that America, this stolen land, was built off the labor of black people and the literal blood, sweat, and tears of our forefathers. But on top of that, when black people did begin to migrate, they realized that America would suffer without the people who built the very land that they so arrogantly call their own. So the real joke is on them. You see, we don't need their support to thrive. We can do that on our own. And in the absence of their brainwashing, even I, couldn't imagine all the possibilities. Wow, what a nice job, Crystal, you killed it. Unfortunately, our event has come to a conclusion. I hope everything that we've said has resonated with our viewership, whether that's I'm Not A by Miriam, Erasing Black History by Jerusha, Brutality by Ezra, the age of social media by Levi, or shifts in black history by Crystal. As you can see, our leaders, our youth, we're lively, we're fiery, we're ready to work, and we're ready to plan for a brighter and better future. Now, with that being said, I'd like to do my thank yous. I'd like to thank our master teacher, Elder Shadrock Porter, for creating this great nation, the Israelite Nation Worldwide Ministries, and also creating the youth arm of the Israelite Nation. Rise. I also, I also like to thank our viewers, our supporters, for coming out, showing out in the chat. Fire, sevens, thank you for keeping us lively. And also, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to email us at getrisehere at gmail.com. If you'd like to stay updated, follow us on Instagram at rise.youthgroup. My name is Jeremiah. Thank you for coming out and showing your support. Peace.